Hello, Jordan. What's up, Michael? Morning pod. We got a morning pod. You had a great workout this morning. It was above average. You had a busy morning with the with the launch, with the Inner Circle app launch. It's a busy morn. It's a busy morn. It's going to be a busy 24 hours. And still posted on the personal trainer Instagram page. Oh, yeah. Did you see it? I haven't, <laughs> but I bet it's good. <laughs> oh, it's a good one. It was when you were day 11 of no scrolling. Really? Oh, yeah. Not this recent no scrolling, a previous one? Probably. It must have been a, a previous one. At that point, it was day 11. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. I'm excited to see what previous Mike was up to. What's current Mike up to? Just hit a little pull day, hitting two morning pods here. Um, yeah, man. Can you hear my daughter in the background screaming? Just barely. Sounds great. Okay. It's excellent Good. background noise. <laughs> we have a real list of things to discuss. Oh, wow. Are we diving right into a Q&A? -er? No. No. But we have a list of non q and a -er things, and then we have a solid Q&A as well. Love that. All right. What's, what's the non-Q&A non things? We have so many options. We have... We have <laughs> notes from Peter Atiyah's book. <laughs> we have... Oh, good. An overrated, underrated series. We have a discussion about Google's new AI, Gemini, and the woke related mistakes that it has been making. I don't know if you've seen any of those pictures. I've seen, yeah, I've seen some pictures of that. That's <laughs> 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 pretty crazy. <laughs> pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. We have uh, the beet juice story. I don't know if if we're talking about that yet. I think we're in the clear, but you know. Now, let's, let's give it some time. <laughs> 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 let's give it some time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I think that's that's our list. I love it. It's a good list. Where do you want to begin? Where do you want to begin? Gemini? <laughs> yep. So what have you seen? I've seen that Gemini is this AI tool that can create images, right? And so apparently it had created images of historical figures, like people who were real, mm -hmm. and it changed their race. Mm -hmm. And I, I forget who the people were, but it took them from white people to black people, I think it was. I, I'm not 100% sure. All, all kinds of, uh, I saw I saw a prompt for the founding fathers of America. And no it was way. like, and, and it was a di diverse and inclusive group of founding fathers. So you Shut had up. someone from each race represented <laughs> as the founding fathers. <laughs> I saw, um, just even because it does the image generator that you described, which is where a lot of these hilarious like quote unquote mistakes, but to make mistakes that egregious, you're getting to the point where I don't know that it was a mis whether or not it was a mistake. That's what I wonder. Yeah. Um, but even just the normal like responses to, to questions similar to what chat GPT would give are uh, almost like rather than truth or the right answer uh, being its its primary default it's this diverse and inclusive answer that it's giving across the board that in my mind is the biggest fault of ai period because as of right now ai it it learns what it's told it's mm -hmm. not like it's all knowing. It's it knows what it's told. And if it's what it's told is wrong, then it will say that as though it's fact. That mm -hmm. that's where that's my like biggest concern with AI is not like not anything like not like crazy crazy conspiracy stuff, but just the fact that people are going to be taking its answers and its lessons as fact when we just it only knows what it's been told and whoever is telling it certain things is determining what AI tells us. Correct. Correct. So it's both how it's programmed and it's also where it's pulling data from. Yeah. Yep. Right. It, it's only as good or as accurate as those variables as well as other like 
you know, people have been work like very smart people have been working on this for a long time, many years. So I don't know all of the factors going into it, but I certainly know, you know, when you ask it about George Washington's ethnicity and it spits out like, there is an argument to be made that George Washington was an African man. And that oh, is based geez. on like this factor and this factor <laughs> and this factor. It's like, we've gone too far. Like this just complete insanity. Yeah. Holy shit. That's crazy. Do you remember any of the other pictures? I feel like I saw like Genghis Khan in one of them or something, or I forget who it was. Um, you know, I, I saw some other ones that weren't just, you know, race switched photos. I saw mm -hmm. uh, something about starving kids and we have all of this extra meat and these kids are like dying of starvation. Should we give them this meat? And it was like, no, you shouldn't give them the meat. Too much meat is unhealthy and it's unsustainable <laughs> for the planet. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Yeah, just I'm I'm very hesitant to be relying on any AI to give us truth. And I guess maybe a little bit afraid, uh, maybe not given how they're operating right now, but of humans relying on it too much as the arbiter of truth. Yeah. You know, the the hard part with that is there isn't a single anything that I would rely on as like the the sole arbiter of truth. You know, like Google is, I, I don't think is a, a good source to use. Even like you can find good things on Google, but even the order in which they present various sources is manipulated based on what they want you to see. And they'll suppress certain things. They'll completely take it off. Like they'll mm -hmm. remove stuff from Google. Like YouTube will remove videos from, from itself. Like the mm -hmm. content is removed. That's one of the, one of the, one of the really good things about Elon Musk taking over Twitter was the idea that anyone can say whatever they believe and it's not going to be censored. Whereas mm -hmm. there's no other platform, especially like Silicon Valley platform that just lets people post whatever. It's it's very censored based on the narrative they want to drive. So whether it's AI or Google or YouTube or whatever, it's there isn't a single thing that I would just take as the sole arbiter arbiter of truth. You know, it's it's a very interesting time that we're in. Dude, I, I saw a screenshot. I think it was... Um... Uh, I think it was from Zero Hedge, which was a blog, like a libertarian blog that I used to read back in my accounting days in like 2009, 2010, 2011, from 2022, where Zero Hedge Twitter account got suspended for hate speech because they used the term illegal aliens, which Jeez. which I, I'm pretty sure was the, the proper- That was the term. Like, yeah. The, that we learned in ninth grade civics class yeah, of what correct. an illegal immigrant in the United States is referred to, like not hateful whatsoever. Correct. It has nothing to do with hate. And like, that's what terms change. And like what was offensive years ago is no longer offensive. And what wasn't offensive is now offensive. It's just times change, things change. That's why you can't judge people based on, you can't judge people in history by today's standards. And history also includes 10 years ago. And and I may I might be completely like head in the sand on this and just uneducated, but is illegal alien not a proper term used now? That is now seen as a highly offensive term. And I think it, it comes from people being like they're not aliens, they're people. And so it I think in well, their of, mind. Of course. It, the term well, wasn't course, used obviously. because they thought that they were from yeah. another planet. That wasn't Cor the origin <laughs> of the <laughs> what? Yeah. I mean, I think it's stupid as I think it's, I listen, I think so much of, of like the highly woke culture is stupid. And I think people are looking for reasons to be offended. And this is what happens when you don't have real problems in your day to day as you look for things to just piss you off and, and all that. Like if there were real, real problems, like if we were at war and, and people were dying, like we wouldn't be like, oh, well, you're calling them the wrong. No, like that wouldn't be a, a thing right now. I think it's when that's like the ultimate ultimate like first world super privileged problem where you can start to really like nitpick on like well you're calling them the wrong name like, all right stop it's that's let's focus on what really matters but the, the suspension is actually less ridiculous now to me because i hadn't even realized that that was an inappropriate term by today's standards or today's moral standards i had thought that was still a correct technical term i think it is it just depends on who you talk to some people say it's offensive and some people say no it's 
it's just logically this is this is what we've referred to them as and that's it it was the header in the textbook like it was on on the exam where we had to do the definitions of the words Correct. that was one of the answers like it wasn't yeah. it wasn't a matter of subjectivity or personal preference that was the answer yeah outlive Remember last week or two weeks or three weeks ago, and you had asked me if I finished the book, and I said that I had finished the book? Yep. I hadn't actually finished the book. Wow, you pulled a Batman. <laughs> you pulled my Batman, remember? Here's what when I thought I finished I sure Batman. Do. <laughs> you didn't watch the last 10 minutes. And was... Man, can't believe he dies. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> like, huh? So, <laughs> like, yeah. Dies. Big explosion over the water. <laughs> Good movie still, but just wasn't expecting to see him die like that. Like Jordan, go watch the last eight minutes of the movie. Oh, man. All right. So you didn't actually finish the book? I, I hadn't finished the book. I had read the first three quarters of it, and then I had read the final chapter, but I hadn't read like the three or four chapters before the last one. How do you do? You just skipped the last few chapters and then went right to the last one? I did only because it was... Uh, highly recommended on a couple of podcasts that he had went on. Got it. That you need the the last chapter is very different than the rest of the book. And is it good? Yeah, there 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 were good chapters. I just you know I felt like I had lo- no. Was the last one a good chapter? Oh, was the last one? Yeah, it was. It was interesting. It was very different than the rest of the book. It was related okay. to his personal um, uh, mental health struggles and the importance mm. of of mental health and emotional health. Um, as it relates to health in general, right? Because all of the rest of the book is related to physical health. And so it's chapter on mental health. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but there were a couple interesting things in those final few chapters. And I figure since we've joked around about it enough, we can give a real quick recap. I think you actually already know the biggest takeaway of the the entire book, which is shifting our focus from medicine 2.0 to medicine 3.0, or basically from reactive medicine to preventative medicine is uh, the single biggest change that would benefit people's lifespan and health span, which which kind of Mm -hmm. bleeds into the second biggest takeaway, which is that it's not just how long you live, but it's also the quality of those years, which is something we all know intuitively, but... um, was cool to see continuously highlighted throughout the book. Yeah. Yeah. Makes total sense. So no need for you to read the rest of it in case you were planning on doing that. I wasn't. I was getting a little bit bored and I was just like, you know, I was a little bored. It It is, uh, it's very comprehensive. It's very on the same page with, I would say 90 plus percent of our outlooks on mm-hmm. fitness, call it, health and fitness. The one area- Um, not to like nitpick, or I guess I'll put all the positives first. Like he did a really good job debunking the whole, like seed oils are making us fat. Um, he did a good job. Oh, did he? Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He did a good job with sleep. There's a really comprehensive chapter on sleep. Uh, you know, I would argue as comprehensive or beneficial as an average sleep book. Um, the, the one place, and I think you have know about this or- or I think you do, but his emphasis on the use of continuous glucose monitors and mm, the benefit yeah, the yeah. benefits that those have related to health or like it wasn't connecting the dots for me, but otherwise very very good my my question I think he's highly invested in a company that does cgms the continuous glucose monitors mm-hmm. I don't know for sure, but that that has led me to wonder is the is the push for that at least in part driven by financial gain on the back end could be do you know who glucose goddess is nope lucky you <laughs> yeah you've really been in that non scroll life it, it's she's this woman she it's crazy she calls herself a goddess um but she uh she is all about like not spiking your glucose and she's been doing this for years. She has a huge, massive audience, millions of followers. And she just recently released this like serum or something that like prevents your, that like lowers your blood sugar spikes. And it's so funny just to see just the, the 
absolute pinnacle of charlatan come out in regard to like she spent her whole career talking about don't eat foods that spike your blood sugar blah 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 and now she's like look this like you can eat cake and it won't spike your blood sugar as much because of this it's just it's like absolute filth and garbage and it's just it's it's one of the worst things i've ever seen in the industry and uh yeah what is it something that you consume orally that reduces glucose spikes i i think so i think you take it around the time that you have a meal i think it's a pill i'm not sure it, it's something that you take and it's supposed to and reduce she invented it yeah it's just natural ingredients it's all these natural ingredients that are supposed oh. to it's like, it's like reduce a, a blood sugar spike yeah, it's a supplement that you take that like you take around the time you have the meal and it reduces the blood sugar spike, which is just, yeah, it's it's so bad. What's the Eric Cressy quote? You know, you've sold out when you get into the supplement industry. <laughs> yeah. Very often true. Yeah. Very often true. I mean, there are just so few supplements that are actually worth your while and worth your money mm -hmm. that- is uh, this is one of the things I su I really respect Lane Norton for because he's in the supplement industry, but I believe he used to sell BCAAs, and then he completely removed them from his line of supplements because he was like, just it wasn't worth it. He, he was like, listen, it, the science doesn't back up, uh, doesn't back this up enough, so I'm just gonna. Re so he completely removed BCAAs. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that's what it was. There was some supplement. I think it was BCAAs. He removed them from his line, which like that takes a tremendous amount of integrity and, and, to, to do. And even before he removed them, I remember him explicitly saying, these don't do anything beneficial for you. I know there are people who mm -hmm. get a little placebo. I know there are people who really like the flavor and the taste. So they enjoy putting them in their water and it helps them drink more water. But just so you know, like these aren't doing anything for you, which, which yeah. is also yeah, yeah. a high integrity move. Yes. Obviously yeah. there's ways to do supplements reasonably right but in general most people yeah, yeah. yeah. when you <laughs> yeah. when you have your own serum so that you can eat cake and not spike your blood sugar too much <laughs> yeah yeah it's a real the, the supplement industry is a real shit infested industry it's it's not good yeah dude what is the proper term now i, I can't stop thinking about it what is it illegal immigrant i think so but even illegal i think is getting a lot of hate well, where people don't want, <laughs> I, dude, don't look at me like that. I, are, I'm just telling you, you what I think I've seen. Are you seen. in the wrong echo? Are you like in AOC land? Or is are these normal people who think that calling someone who is an illegal immigrant an illegal immigrant is wrong? Dude, I, I think that the, the number of people who actually believe that it's wrong are a very small minority, but Got they're it. super loud. Got it. So I, I don't think it's a huge, I mean, I could be wrong. I don't think it's a huge number of people. Are you an AOC land just coming out? <laughs> I, I can't wrap my head around it. It's, it's, so this this would be the same people who who think that uh, that BMI is a racist metric. Correct. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yep. Where will we go next? Where will we go? You never know on the personal trainer podcast. How to become a personal trainer <laughs> Uh, overrated or underrated? Let's do it. Oatmeal. Underrated, especially right now. Yeah, I know you're, you're not really paying attention in the, in the social media world, but. Oh, I'm paying attention. Uh, there's a big thing that, are you? Did you see the no, big thing that came I out? Didn't. There's a whole thing that oatmeal makes you infertile recently. <laughs> that oatmeal, <laughs> it makes you infertile. And then, you know, Paul Saladino is always talking about how oatmeal is like the worst thing you can ever have. Like what? It's yeah. There's a huge number of people who actually think oatmeal is a terrible, terrible thing for you to eat, despite the outrageous amounts of evidence that it's one of the the greatest, uh, greatest foods you could have. One of the greatest carbohydrate sources you can have for so many reasons. So it's it's very underrated. I'm a huge fan of oats. I also like oatmeal. I love oats. <laughs> Big fan of oats. Big fan. <laughs> eat them every day. <laughs> You're dialed. You got your Trump impression dialed. Um, I didn't know that oats were uh, seen as, uh, you know, terrible for you. I had thought they were probably, I thought they were probably slightly overrated because I was coming from the perspective of 
Oatmeal is a highly nutritious food that you should start every single day with. Bro, your your knowledge of the fitness industry in terms of like where people are at is circa like 2015. Good. That's where, that's that's like where, where it sort of ends. That's where I want to stay. Yeah, but we're we're almost a decade later. So like it, the the overrated, underrated, I think I probably would have agreed with you in like 2015 based on where people were. But now – People are thinking oatmeal is the devil's breakfast. I might be in 1995. Yeah, but who, who's actually thinking that? Like Paul Saladino is to fitness as BMI is racist is to cult Correct. culture. Yeah, like, yeah, if, if yeah, you, yeah. If you, if you ask, ten, if you ask 10 people on the street, is oatmeal healthy? I would imagine like the over under is going to be 9.5 on yes, it's healthy. Agreed. And yeah, so there, yeah. there might agree. be like some loud carnivores and like some people who eat bull testicles who think that oatmeal is bad for you. But the majority of people, right? Like when you say I'm in 2015, I'm not headline reading what these outrageous, like clickbaity <laughs> people are talking about in 2024, um, which, you know, I, is it, it's better for you. That's for sure. It's definitely better for me. I think it's, I think it would be better for anyone. Like, I, and I don't even think that most of these people who say things like this actually believe it. I would imagine it's just engagement baiting and and working to carve out uh, like some type of audience. Correct. They don't actually believe it, but the people who follow them end up believing it and and like living and dying by it. Yeah, that's right. That's all I had on my overrated, underrated list. That's it? Oatmeal? But we can just make things up. Okay. Overrated, underrated, face pulls. See, here's the thing about overrated, underrated. You have to know where <laughs> culture's at to be able to answer. So tell me, what do people think of face polls? And then I'll tell you if- Dude, they're... I'm asking, no, I'm just going to give you your, like, you can go off of your 1995 <laughs> position and then I'll, I'll in, give insight into current day. Uh, face polls have to be underrated. I mean, even in the little bit of like, you know, training stuff that I see- um, I just don't, I, I still don't see enough emphasis on rear delt training. Um, in terms of exercise selection for the rear delts, and, and that's assuming you're doing like a rear delt variation, you can do a, a higher face pull variation, uh, where your, your hands actually come back at about the same level as your elbows where you end up hitting more mid trap and even a little bit of lower trap, which I really like. Um, yeah. Face pulls are underrated. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Your immediate thought went to rear delt. My immediate thought goes to rather than like one of the muscles, it, it more thinks about the benefits, right? So it's like, yeah, sort of like how, how, in, in the mentorship, when we talk about sales, we talk about facts versus benefits, right? And understanding the difference between facts and benefits when you're running a launch, you're trying to run a sale. Most people focus on the fact and, and not enough on the benefit. My immediate thought goes to postural improvement, shoulder health, um, yeah. like doing more pulling as opposed to pushing. Yeah. Like there's so many benefits with face pulls. And my also immediate thought in terms of muscle, like go rhomboid, low mid trap. Mm -hmm. And so like- mm -hmm complete i completely agree it's very underrated for all of those reasons yeah. for sure it's just interesting how we could talk about the same exact exercise and the immediate pictures in our heads go sort of differently which is well, reminiscent of of well, society as a whole but the, it's it's, that, I agree. it's just step one because it's yeah. at least implied for me that training those muscles are good for your posture and that we right, don't train right, those right, muscles right. enough, right? Like we could say, yep. yeah, don't don't horizontal press versus pull at a three to one ratio because those are the muscles you see in the mirror and you want to have a big chest and that's cool. The benefits are implied. And I get on a podcast and of people who might not know that, you know, explicitly stating them <laughs> is a good idea. Respectfully. I mean, I don't know. You're stating it for a reason, I assume. But – underrated because training <laughs> yeah, those muscles have underrated. benefits. We wouldn't train those muscles if they didn't have benefits. Correct. That's true. One might, but are there any muscles that we shouldn't train? Are there any muscles that don't get benefit from training? Oh, I got one. What is it? Bladder. 
you shouldn't oh, train oh, that. The oh, more you train it, the weaker it you gets. Wanted, you know what I you mean? You wanted to talk about this. I don't oh, know. I actually didn't even think about that, but yeah, I do. That's, dude, I was telling you that, that's, what a transition, by the yeah. way. What an absolute, like, perfect transition. I've been really trying to drink more water, but I realized getting full from the water is only like 20% of why I don't really enjoy it. The worst part is how badly I have to piss so frequently. How, f- how like, frequently? I feel how like, frequently? dude, right now I've got to pee super bad and we've only been sitting down for 40, uh, 35 minutes. When you were drinking a lot of water, how often were you peeing? Dude, every 10 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> That seems like <laughs> that seems like an exaggeration. Every ten waking minutes, not well, every that's ten still sleeping a lot minutes. of minutes, <laughs> or not very many. It's a lot of peeing. Yeah, yeah, and it's all super clear. It's great. The you're definitely right that drinking more water. <laughs> that's great. You're definitely right that drinking more water leads to having to go to the bathroom more. Absolutely, um, way more. Yeah, I don't – before you'd said every 15 minutes, every 10 minutes, I don't – you know, if we had a camera on you, I don't know that it would be that often literally. Whoa, don't get a camera on me <laughs> when I'm using the bathroom, you perv. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the benefits outweigh the costs. The cost is simply time, right? That's the only inconvenience yeah. is you got to walk to a bathroom. And realistically – if we had a camera on you and then the camera stopped being on you once you walked in the bathroom, but if we had a camera on you at all times of the day otherwise, <laughs> I would say that maybe you're peeing every 45 to 60, like maybe you're going once an hour. It might not even be that often, um, which is definitely more oh, it's than- definitely at the very least that often. Mm, waking hours, Jordan sleeps about eight hours a night, so that's 16 pees a day. I don't, I doubt it, but you could prove me wrong, but I doubt it. Um, I'll prove you wrong. I'll FaceTime you every time I pee. <laughs> okay. Video on my face. Yeah, that please. Uh, <laughs> yeah, th- that's one of the costs for sure. But it's just time and all of the benefits of staying properly hydrated certainly outweigh those costs. That's why anytime you have someone with a, a who does long podcasts, two, three, four hour podcasts, anytime they have an elite athlete on, there's a discussion around having to go to the bathroom because they usually have to take two or three breaks during the podcast because, Mm -hmm. you know, whether it's Lance Armstrong or whoever, just drinking lots of water. Yeah. Yeah. It's just not comfy. But how often do you pee? If I'm drinking, I I, I don't don't keep track. Always hydrated. Yeah. I don't keep track. When was the last time you were dehydrated? Every morning. All right. But like, I mean, daily, like, at, not after sleeping. You mean like when did I not drink enough water for an extended period of time? Yeah, outside of sleeping. So for like weeks, I would just be underhydrated and not really know it or pay attention. Not to necessarily it. weeks, but like for like a a day or two. I don't know. There were probably somewhat recently when I just wasn't thinking about drinking water, didn't have access, was on the go, didn't properly plan. Yeah. Do you feel it? Like, do you feel it when you're not hydrated? Can you feel mentally, physically? Yep, both. I, I can feel it in a workout if I'm not properly hydrated, and I can feel it uh, working if I'm not properly hydrated, like doing computer work. Mm. But using the bathroom more often is just, it's part of the game. You just said it's really uncomfortable. That leads me to believe that it's not just the inconvenience of going to the bathroom more often, but there's actually physical discomfort from having a full bladder more often. Yeah, especially if I'm driving. I've got to pull over. I got the seatbelt wrapped around my bladder. Dude, not fun. Maybe there's- But you've got to do it. You've got to do it for your health. Probably, so it's got to be There's probably a happy medium, right? There's no medium with hydration, Michael. <laughs> it's got to be maximum or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Always maximum. Always. Let's uh, want to do a couple Q&A. You want to do another overrated, underrated? Sure. Okay. Overrated, underrated, owning an online fitness business, being your own boss, running your own, like having like an online business as opposed to anything else that you could be doing, not even just in-person coaching, but online fitness business. Um, 
I think it's too related to the temperament of the individual. And what I mean by that is for some people, it's massively underrated. And for some people, mm -hmm. it's probably slightly overrated. Um, overall, I would say that it's underrated, assuming the amount of effort and time and patience that it takes to go from not having a business to having a business that sustains, you know, a reasonable lifestyle. Mm. Who do you think it's slightly overrated for? Like what type of person? I think it's slightly overrated for a type of person who is happy in a nine to five, who is terrible at self-motivation and self-discipline, um, likes having a boss. Like <laughs> What? <laughs> the way you just emphasize terrible is who is just terrible. At <laughs> because you, because yep. you, you are your own boss. Like you, you don't yep. have someone barking at you to do what you need to do every day. Um, someone who is okay with the structure and uh, uh, like lack of freedom associated with most traditional jobs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you enjoy sitting under fluorescent lights and like with bad posture and you know, I'm, I'm reflecting on my own experience in corporate America, but, uh, you know, having to, uh, every Monday, what'd you do this weekend? Every Tuesday, you talk about the weather. Every Wednesday, oh, it's hump day. Every Thursday, you're like, oh, the weekend's coming. Every Friday, what are you going to do this weekend? And then you repeat that, you know, every single week for 40 years. If you're into that, um, ba basically people who really like corporate culture, mm. people who are good at politicking corporate culture and enjoy it, I suppose, because, uh, when you have your own business, merit is rewarded one-to-one, -one, like maybe not immediately, but over the long run, your effort compiles and the market rewards you. Whereas you can be the best employee by 3X, whoever the worst employee is, and you're not getting 3X the salary that year. If you're, if you're both at the same level, you might get a few percentage points higher raise, but yeah. So mostly underrated. Yeah. I agree because the benefits, I, I think, I think by and large it's underrated, but I also think there are parts of it that are overrated or at the very least misunderstood. I, I think that, I think that the longer you do it and the longer you do it generally leads to more success, the more underrated it becomes. But I think people assume that they'll get the benefits of doing it for a long time after a very brief period of time, mm -hmm. which is like, so the, I think the beginning is overrated and the later on is underrated. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the benefits you get are very much worth it. If you are willing and able to go through that very difficult beginning period. Mm -hmm. And I think that for the people it's not good for are the people who, the people who feel very entitled to success early on. Yeah. If you have a sense of entitlement to, to make a certain amount of money or succeed at, at a, a, a really any level early on, it's not a good idea. Like it's much better for you to work for somebody else where you get predefined payment, predefined workload, predefined work times. And it's very clear. This is what you get because this is what you're putting in. And this is what we've agreed upon. If you're the kind of person that doesn't have any entitlement and doesn't have any ego, not even any ego, but relatively small ego, and you're okay with putting in a tremendous amount of work up front for literally zero pay. And also you are the kind of person that you have to have a certain level of grit and, and rough skin and in turn or tough skin, like where you don't let things bother you as much. Mm -hmm. Things can still bother you, but it can't bother you as much as it does for a lot of other people, mm -hmm. whether it's people disagreeing with you, 
people uh, thinking you're stupid, people not wanting to work, like whatever it is. There, there are, you have to have a, a level of toughness to you where if you're objective and honest, yeah, I just, I don't have that level of toughness. And, and also I think it, it could be toughness, but also the, the ability to, even if it bothers you, that's okay. As long as you keep going and keep giving it a shot, like it's okay if something bothers you, even if you don't have tough skin, but it's not okay if you just quit once something tough happens, once something difficult happens. I think a lot of people are, you know, if you need an HR department to go to have a discussion because you're upset about what someone said to you, not a good fit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like if you need the HR department, you need someone to sit you down and have mediation because someone said something that really upset you. Don't do this. There's no HR department and no one gives a fuck, including your HR department, but that's their job. So they've got to do it, but there's no HR department in, in this. So, um, dude, I'm so glad that I don't have a business that requires me to have an HR department. I just, oh my gosh, could you imagine? Or you don't work so, for a business with an HR department. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Did, did you have an HR department when you were oh, yeah. Were, like, what was, I've never worked with a business. Like, how did that work? Did they have meetings? Did like, was there ever any issues with HR? Did they send out memos? The only time I remember having any kind of conversation with HR was when I was quitting after my two years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and she was like really digging, trying to figure out my plans. Like, what firm are you going to? Like, are you going to a different one of our competition? <laughs> da, da 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 da. And I didn't. I had no idea what I was going to do. I was like, no, I just I just don't want to do this anymore. And so I'm going to go do something else. She thought you were lying. She was like, no, where are you going? At first, she thought I was lying, and then she, and then I remember her like kind of laughing at me during the exit interview. Like, oh, like oh, you're just leaving and you don't know what you're doing. Like, no one does that. Like, and that, that, that was like five years of workload in and of itself. Anger. Yeah. yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. You'll see. <laughs> yeah. That just gave you fire for those next five yeah, years. Yeah. At least. Yeah. Did you have to have an exit interview? Is that required? I don't know. I was still working there and she put it on my calendar and you got to turn your computer in. So you, you gave your two weeks notice and they were like, all right, how did you give your two weeks notice? Did you email? Yeah, did I sent, you tell someone, like, how did I that sent work? an email on a Friday at like 5 PM. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? I don't know. I, I probably Googled how to quit a job and like had like a very basic email template, like, just putting in my two weeks notice. Thank you. Were you nervous coming in the next Monday? Yeah, probably slightly. Probably slightly. And do you, did, did anyone come up to you and be like, what's going on? Like, why are you leaving? Like, Man, it's really a blur. All I really remember is this woman's face from HR and like the like smirk on her face when I was telling her, you know, I might try this. I might try this as far as like business ideas because she was really grilling me on what my next plans were and the feeling of walking out of the building on my last day at like 2 30 in the afternoon on a summer day beautiful weather in july just like weighed off my shoulder the most free i've ever felt in my entire life mm -hmm. Was there anyone there that you were friends with that like you actually liked or no? Yeah. Uh, um, a, a buddy I'm still friends with. Matt Wilson is his name. Oh. He's uh, He was one of the early, early investors before us in – why am I blanking on the name of the company? The food – Counter? Yeah, in Counter. Um, he's a real good guy. Yeah, th I, had, I had friends there, people I started with. Okay. Yeah. Did you tell them before you gave your two weeks or you told them after? I probably didn't tell anyone. I kept everything very close to the vest, like in general. Got it. But I overall, I agree with you. Underrated online fitness business. But going into it with proper expectations, actually having a desire to help people, um, not expecting to get rich immediately, which is why it's so funny that so many of these like business coaches advertise, you know, make 40K in your first month, uh, use these <laughs> systems. Otherwise, we'll, 
coach you for free if you don't, but uh, pay us 10K up front. And then it, it's all like, obviously it works in terms of marketing because there are enough people who are like, oh, I want to make, I wanna make this it. much money. Yeah. But the, pe- and, and we've helped, you know, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands at this point of coaches the ones who succeed aren't the ones who come out the gate trying to make as much money as possible ever. Yeah. I was telling you the other day, I was talking to a buddy who joined one of those a guru master mind gurus, like paid almost $10,000 up front. And I was like, how, how is it? And he was just like, dude, oh, mm-hmm. not, not good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just not mm-hmm. good. So much of it is nonsense. So if you want to apply to the join, to join the mentorship, where you can actually learn to be a great coach and help people and also learn over many years how to build your business, you can apply. Link is in the show notes, but don't expect the mastermind guru nonsense. Yeah. Should we do a Q&A? Yeah, let's do a, you know, we're going to film another one after this. Maybe let's rapid fire a couple. All right. Uh, this, is a, this is a good question. I actually spoke with Susan about this. We had a good talk. Do you consider bodybuilders to be athletes? And if you want, you can Google search the definition of athlete just so. So we're working with the same thing? Yeah. A person who is proficient in sports and other forms of physical exercise. Mm -hmm. I'm going to Google sport. We're going to get the definition of a sport. Well, the Merriam-Webster dictionary version is a really good one. I'm going with Google because Gemini is my truth. (laughs) An activity involving physical exertion and skill in which an individual or team competes against others for entertainment. Interesting. That's not the definition I went off of. So yes, my my initial gut reaction is no, bodybuilders aren't athletic generally. Like there are some, but those are the exception. Bodybuilders um, are extremely aesthetic and, uh, and have amazing proportions and lots of muscle and very little body fat. Um, but if you think of like your average bodybuilder, like running a route and catching a pass or trying to like cross over dribble and, and shoot a jump shot, like it looks pretty ugly. Uh, but given the fact that given that the definition of sport and the definition of athlete, yeah, because bodybuilding technically based on this definition is a sport and an athlete is a person who's proficient in sports and bodybuilders are proficient in bodybuilding. So technically, yes, but you know, yeah, the, the def, I was going with Miriam Webster and it says the definition of an athlete is a person who is trained or skilled in exercise, in exercises, sports or games requiring physical strength, agility, or stamina. So by that definition, I also agree that, that, bodybuilders are athletes here's what i would say here's my uh here's my view of it they are athletes but on the continuum of athleticism they are on like among the lowest end of that right and for the same reason that you just like you look at a running back or you look at a a soccer player or you look at a lacrosse player or a hockey player the if we're looking at a well-rounded athlete, that essentially means they can do so many things. A well-rounded athlete is someone who can express and display so many characteristics of athleticism. They can be strong, they can be fast, they can be explosive, they have agility, they have endurance, they have so the more well-rounded of an athlete you are, the more you can display and do at a higher level. Mm-hmm. Bodybuilders are very one-dimensional athletes. Mm -hmm. They are very good at one specific thing. Whereas a football player is very good, especially like a running back, is very good at many different things. And you could take a running back and in pretty brief period of time, they could probably be a very high-level bodybuilder. You couldn't take a bodybuilder and expect them to be a very good running back in the same amount of time or even potentially any period of time. So I I think that, yes, they're athletes, but on the continuum of athleticism, 
they are very low compared to most other people who would be considered athletes. And that's by the nature of what they need to do to prepare for their sport. The by by the nature of what a bodybuilder has to do to prepare for their sport, it's incredibly one dimensional. They don't need to be a well-rounded athlete. Mm -hmm. They just need to be very specifically good at one thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas football players, basketball players, hockey players, martial artists, whatever, they need to have so many areas of, of athleticism. So, yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think a good way to put it in that running back example would be that it would be easier for a running back to compete in bodybuilding than it would be mm -hmm. for a high level running back to compete in bodybuilding than it would be for a high level bodybuilder to compete as a running back at a high level. Correct. Correct. Agreed. That being said, I, I still, that doesn't say anything about, uh, about the sport of bodybuilding or what I think of bodybuilders, but more of a semantic based on the definition of athlete. Correct. Yeah. No, it doesn't change what I think about bodybuilders, but it's just like, it's a fact. I, like we could even like, if we wanted to, we could categorize which athletes are the most athletic and which ones are the least and have a whole continuum based on the demands of their sport. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like I would say, <clears throat> and, I would say for example that. Sorry, real quick. We have that continuum, right? And bodybuilders are at the low end of the athletic continuum compared to high-level athletes in other sports. I would still say that the overwhelming majority of the population is on the less athletic side compared to bodybuilders. Yeah, the overall majority of the population, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Of course. That's a no-brainer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Susan brought up a good one because she, she was talking about like NASCAR drivers and like, is that a sport? And, and the way I think about it is because when you look at the actual sport, yeah, they're just driving, which is, I would say, more of a skill. Mm -hmm. But in order to train for that skill, for example, all the forces that are on their neck, they need to do a lot of strength training in order to withstand that force, a lot of grip training in order to hold the steering wheel properly over that amount of time and that, that those speeds and those forces. Uh, so there's a lot of training that goes into being good and being able to sustain that skill and do that sport. So, so yeah, like I would, but then again, in terms of the continuum, a, a NASCAR driver's training is very one dimensional as it, it, they're not going to be as athletic as I would say, probably a NASCAR driver is probably not as athletic as a bodybuilder in many ways. Um, but they are because the, they're their uh, training is so one dimensional relative to athletes further along the continuum. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely right. Who do you think is the most athletic? Let's lead off the next podcast talking about who is the most athletic. Love that. Jordan can take a pee. I'm going to finish my muscle milk. Thank you. Everyone have a great week. We'll be back next Tuesday. Uh, Many of you have left five-star reviews recently, Apple, Spotify. It really helps the podcast reach more people. Jordan and I are greatly appreciative of you. So thank you very much for those five-star reviews. See you next week. See you.